Good morning, Thomas. Good morning, Jill. And um, throughout the years, I have known peaceful, pacifistic gardeners who often resort to militaristic warfare against garden pests. And I think today you're going to be shedding some light on more humane ways to deal with um, pest control in the garden. Well, I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> we'll hear. We'll get to hear about all of them. And I'd like to introduce my guest now. Thomas Whitman, owner of Gophers Limited of Felton, California, started his career as an organic farmer in 1982. And Thomas Whitman has been a consultant on rodent problems since 1991. He was educated at the University of California, Santa Cruz, as an ecologist. And Thomas holds a PCA license from the Department of Pesticide Regulation and a nuisance animal trapping license from the California Department of Fish and Game. And his company, Gophers Limited, is dedicated to the humane and efficient resolution of human and animal conflicts. Um, And it sounds like your primary focus, Thomas, is on gopher and mole control. So we'll be hearing about that. What I would like to know first off, Thomas, is how did you get involved in pest, in pest control and animal-human almost relations in the garden and farm? Well, that's an interesting question. It's kind of a uh, serendipitous thing that happened to me. I was an organic farmer for um, 12 years, and I caught gophers and moles and actually raised a lot of animals on the farm and really got to like being around animals and understanding how they, how they live and what they like. And then... Um, My children were born, and I decided to get a job with benefits instead of being a farmer. And so I was lucky enough to get a job at the University of California working at the um, teaching farm, the uh, Center for Agroecology. And there I um, worked with uh, actually more as as the maintenance of the grounds, and I ended up trapping gophers every day there and working with all kinds of pest animals like rats and whatnot. And um, that evolved into uh, giving lectures to the public about um, trapping gophers and taking care of animals. And and then I uh, decided to do that full-time instead of um, work at the university. So I left there, and I've been doing that ever since. One question I had for you, Thomas, was do you do you like gophers? <laughs> That's something I told people I was going to be interviewing you, and they're like, oh, gophers. So many people despise gophers. Can you tell our listeners, do you actually like these creatures, and if so, why? Well, I admire gophers. I think they're an incredibly courageous animal. Um, one story about gophers when I was farming, if you were – sitting on top of a big caterpillar tractor with a disc harrow behind you and you flip the gopher out of the ground with the disc and you got off the tractor and uh, that gopher was on the surface instead of running like a like a mouse for example the gopher would actually stand up on its hind legs and growl at you I mean they're <laughs> they're uh, fearless and I, I've heard too that they are very territorial and they will if put in a cage don't they fight and that's true. They're extremely territorial, and they will uh, fight each other in uh, in a cage. So it sounds like they're definitely very feisty creatures. They are, and uh, I think that's one of the reasons that, that people have a, a real fun vision of them. Whenever I talk to people about gophers, they, a lot of people despise what they do, but they kind of admire the personality that uh, they seem to perceive in a gopher. Very persistent. And, you know, Bill Mollison, um, I've read a lot of books about permaculture, and he actually says they're great soil aerators, and they're down there kind of aerating the soil and moving it around. And um, Do you agree with that? Oh, totally. They're, well, yes and no. I mean, they're great soil aerators, but, for example, on a, uh, a steep hillside or, or on a levee, like, for example, in, in uh, Watsonville, California, there's a big problem with gophers piercing the levee walls. So they are aerating and letting drainage happen, but sometimes it's not a great advantage. Mm -hmm. But one thing they also do is they they stir minerals and bring minerals up to the surface, too. Can one or two gophers do a lot of damage? You know how people have the big mounds in their yard? How many gophers are usually present maybe in, let's say, a half-acre lot? Well, in a half-acre lot, usually no more than a dozen at the most. Mm -hmm. But one gopher can do a tremendous amount of damage. I've seen uh, one gopher take a whole row of raspberries down or um, a mature cherry tree or a fig tree especially. They love figs. And um, a gopher 
makes uh, about uh, four mounds a day, three or four mounds every day. So, you know, over the, over the course of a week, it looks like you have a whole community of gophers when it could just be one. Do you think it's possible for um, us to live in harmony with our gophers, <laughs> or is it an impossibility? Yes, but you have to use some kind of barrier to, to protect the core of, of uh, plants that you really like. And usually the barrier is a gopher basket or, or um, putting gopher wire in, in uh, flower beds to prevent that from happening, because there's nothing that's going to stop a gopher from... Um, basically eating what they want to eat. Tell us a bit about the less humane and the more toxic methods of um, pest control and gopher control, and then let's go into some least toxic methods. Starting with the toxic methods, which are the ones I don't use, you can go into any hardware store and buy this uh, this poison called strychnine. And uh, strychnine baits are, are these little uh, seeds that are coated with strychnine powder that uh, you pour down into a gopher hole and the gopher eats it and, and dies. It's a very powerful poison, and when, the, when an animal dies from strychnine, this, the poison actually becomes stronger than when it was in the first place. And so any animal that eats the animal that uh, died from strychnine poisoning dies as well, usually, or gets very sick. So the strychnine, which is very common, is really a bad thing. And I've seen uh, the other problem is Often a gopher or a mole, gopher and mole mounds look similar. If you put strychnine poison into a mole tunnel, the moles will just push it straight out because they eat worms and not plants. And then it's on the surface, and then birds eat it. And I've seen birds die without even flying away, just eating the, the poison and just die right there on the surface. So inadvertently, you can often uh, poison animals you're not intending to. I've heard a lot about cats that get poisoned. Cats and dogs mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. So that's the most toxic. And then there's anticoagulant baits, which are less toxic but still have secondary poisoning. And so um, I tend to, to uh, try to encourage people not to use any poison baits. Well, for one thing, using poison baits also doesn't ever indicate to you that you've solved the problem. Whereas if you're trapping a gopher, for example and you catch the gopher, you know you got them. So you know the problem is at least under control. Now, when you say trapping, Thomas, do you mean live trapping, or is this where the gopher meets its maker <laughs> in your <laughs> trap? <laughs> well, I usually um, do lethal trapping. I have this trap that I use called the cinch gopher trap, which is a, uh, a humane but lethal trap. Humane meaning it... it uh, almost 100% of the time will will kill the gopher in a matter of seconds, whereas most gopher traps don't. The uh, gophers often uh, are held by the pinches of a trap for hours and hours while they, they die at slow death. So um, I prefer it to be clean and quick, and um, the cinch trap uh, really does that. Is this trap easy to set up um, for a homeowner or someone that isn't an expert in this? Um, how what, what does the trap do? It just kind of closes down really quickly on the gopher. Right, on the gopher's neck. Mm -hmm. And uh, the advantage of the cinch trap is that it doesn't uh, require... A lot of people have trapped gophers and they dig down to the, what's called the main burrow and they put the trap going either direction. And then they close up the, uh, the tunnel so it kind of looks like they weren't there. And then to check the trap, they have to go and open it up again. But with the cinch trap, it's the, and the method I use is called the surface trapping method. It doesn't require uh, hardly any digging at all. You just open the burrow from the surface, and gophers always come back and close the burrow opening again. And this trap fits down inside the burrow and captures them when they go to close the burrow opening. Now, in a gardening class I took recently, they were talking about how gophers will smell you if you, should you wear gloves and kind of try and not, how's their sense of smell? Should you try and mask your um, human scent? That's a good question. When you're trapping in the main burrow with the, those other kind of traps, I think that might be true. When you're doing surface trapping and uh, encouraging a gopher to come to an open burrow, there is, um, they're so compelled to do it that it doesn't really matter. 
And they probably smell us up there anyway. <laughs> yeah. So, so the cinch trap sounds like it's actually a very um, a good way to uh, for gopher control. Are there any other things that you recommend to um, control gophers in a more humane way than the poison? Well, there are, there's a lot of different methods out there. Um, there's uh, various liquid drenches that you can put in your garden that will kind of deter them from coming in. Um, usually what what they do is they, they push the gopher over to your neighbor's yard or something like that. But if, if you don't have a close neighbor, then you can use these things to keep them pushed away. Most of them are made out of castor oil. Oh, interesting. Wow. I wonder if that's toxic to gophers, or do they just not like the viscosity of it? No, what it is is bitter. Oh. It puts a bitter flavor in the soil, and they don't like it. And would you have to pour, like, gallons of castor oil on your yard, or how would you do that? No, it comes in a uh, container. You can get it at most hardware stores that attaches to your hose, and it mixes with water and sprays and drenches into the soil. Oh. It's, um, it's actually cheaper to do it yourself if you just buy the castor oil from a drugstore and put it in one of those garden sprayers. So you just basically drench the soil and, uh, and make it bitter. And would you, you wouldn't want to spray it on your plants or kind of just around the perimeter of where you're growing plants? You spray it on the ground. Mm -hmm. And then there's other uh, formulas that are made of uh, hot pepper also that uh, just make it unpleasant for gophers mm -hmm. to be around. The other thing is gophers don't like uh, any meat product or fish product. And uh, um, a lot of people use fish emulsion as a fertilizer, and that, that in itself will keep a gopher away. Good to know, because I've used that actually in my yard. Uh, what about, have you heard about essential oils as a gopher deterrent? I've heard about that for um, insects. Not, never have I heard about it in relationship to gophers. Um, but I guess you could say that uh, castor oil is kind of an essential oil. It's, an, it's aromatic in a certain way. And for those of you who just tuned in, this is Sustainable World on KCSV 91.9 FM in Santa Barbara. And I'm Jill Cloutier, and I'm speaking this morning with Thomas Whitman, owner of Gophers Limited of Felton, California. And Gophers Limited is dedicated to the humane and efficient resolution of human and animal conflict. So we're speaking about gophers this morning, which I took a poll of the number one um, most unwanted pest in the yard and garden, and gophers came up number one, Thomas, <laughs> with all my friends. Can you tell us about, is there any truth to um, the idea of plants, certain plants like gopher purge, I think it's called, or spurge that people plant in the garden to keep away gophers? Um, well, I've taken a lot of pictures uh, of gopher purge and gophers um, right next to each other. I don't think they actually keep them away. Um, I've never seen a gopher eat gopher purge. So I know that it's one of the plants that uh, I have a list of plants that, that I say gophers eat last. Because in, in a dry situation, a gopher will eat almost anything. Uh, not just for food, but because gophers get their liquid to get their water from plants, too. Oh. So that's why they like the more succulent bulb-type plants. But unfortunately, can we eat gopher pur purge? <laughs> you could, you couldn't have a whole crop of gopher purge. Can we eat it? I don't think so. <laughs> there is another plant that I've been experimenting with called sour clover. Mm -hmm. That also gophers. It, that one seems to uh, be able to be a barrier, or if you use it as a cover crop before planting something, seems to be a, a, an effective deterrent. Mm -hmm. And uh, what's interesting about that plant is that it's a uh, the uh, roots have this uh, chemical called coumarin in, a, in the roots. And uh, it's the basis for the blood thinner called coumadin. And gophers have a very thin blood, which enables them to live underground with low oxygen levels. And so uh, I think when they get in contact with this, they tend to avoid it just naturally. And it's a great cover crop because it's a nitrogen fixer and it's kind of pretty. It could be a good... Uh, Replacement for a clover crop, for example, like a red clover crop, which would be a gopher attractant. That sounds really great. So you could plant that maybe to fix nitrogen in your soil before you plant your garden. And would, the, would that maybe keep the gophers away? Yes. Yeah. I've, then, seen it, I've seen it work a couple times, yeah. 
And then the gophers pretty much say that you have driven your gophers away by doing kind of a combination. You've done the singe traps. You've planted your sour clover. Then you put in your garden. Do they have scouts? Do they kind of run around and check things out and then call in all the other gophers once they know the more edible, juicy things are growing, are back growing in your garden? Well, it seems like it. I mean, what, what, I, what I see is that there is like a, an ocean of gophers out there, and there are spots that gophers like more than others. And, of course, gardens on a south-facing, well-drained area are probably the prime spots. And so when you remove gophers from those spots, other gophers do want to move in, especially if the tunnels are already built. It's like finding a beautiful home in a meadow and no one living there. I mean, just like uh, they'll move right in. So there's constant pressure from other gophers. So basically, would you say, Thomas, that one of the main ways to keep gophers out of your yard is maybe prevention? Like you were talking about barrier methods a bit in the beginning of the show. I'd like to hear more about that. To prevent them from actually entering into the garden first, would, is that kind of the best way to handle gophers And before you get a huge problem with them eating everything that you're growing? Well, it, it's certainly a way where you can feel secure about it and maybe even tolerate gophers that are not uh, a problem in your garden. For example, if you're using gopher baskets, like for tomato plants, um, and if you're growing a tomato plant, you might expect for the time you're growing it, maybe 60 days, to to uh, get you know a good part of what you're going to can or something in the fall. And one gopher can can eat you know six tomato plants in a couple days. So if you have them in baskets, then at least you you're protected. Those plants are protected. Or you can underwire a whole garden with uh, gopher wire. Um, and I'm, when I say gopher wire, I mean this wire that's made specifically to be buried, either hardware cloth or real gopher wire. Um, using chicken wire or aviary wire, it just doesn't last very long underground. And there's another barrier you can make by digging a trench uh, about two feet deep around your garden and putting gopher wire straight down with an L bend at the bottom with the L face on the outside, which also is a barrier for gophers. But you have to have a surface barrier, too, because at night gophers come out and just wander around and find new homes. That sounds like a really... I've done the chicken wire thing before, and it seemed like it worked in some ways. Um, but they actually wiped out... We planted a bunch of baby trees, and they got those, which was disappointing. Um could you tell us a bit about the life cycle of the gopher, and is that important in knowing when to set traps and when to um, use these other methods of control? Well, gophers live about three or four years, and um, when they meet um, at night, probably on the surface, uh, maybe a male and female gopher might bump into each other and and um, create a, a family. Although the they'll never see each other again because gophers are solitary. When a female is pregnant, she'll dig this, this special kind of burrow called a nesting site. And it's usually underneath a tree. And it's about two or three feet deep. And uh, she'll dig three chambers down there to have her babies in. And one's a nest and one's a uh, food storage area. And the other one's actually a latrine. Because they seal up this underground chamber for about two weeks. And the babies are born and then she weans them and gets them eating the solid food that she has stored down there. And then she opens the burrow back up, and then they kind of erupt. And then uh, eight or ten gophers will come out of that burrow and just spread out because they're territorial and solitary. And so when that cycle happens, you have this big rush of gophers, and uh, that's when uh, the attack happens. Mm -hmm. So if you can time it right, you could actually um, wipe out a whole generation of gophers. That sounds so mean, but... Well, I look at it as managing the herd. Mm -hmm. And if you if you um, do gopher trapping through the winter and early spring months, then what you're doing is bringing the breeding population down to a lower level. And so you just keep the numbers down. One, one way of um, pest control and gopher control that really, I think, makes the most sense to me, or, or I think could you could use it in tandem with the singe traps, is the pr use of predators and natural predators of the gophers. Could you tell our listeners about some of those predators and how you could attract them to your own um, garden? Well, the easiest and uh, probably the most effective predator I know of is the cat. 
And um, if you have a good cat, then uh, sometimes your problems just go away really quickly. And uh, I've taken a survey of, of uh, audiences because I give a lot of lectures. And I always ask them, what is the cat that's the best gopher cat? And uh, I found that most people say that it's either a orange tabby, the large orange tabby cat, or the uh, large black and white cat. And uh, they're the best gopher catchers. There's a, um, a project up here in the Santa Cruz area called Project Purr that, uh, that uh, catches feral cats. And um, a lot of times they just get euthanized. But this project uh, kind of takes the feral cats and finds people that want outdoor cats and, um, and uh, settles them in your home so they can be your ratters and mousers and gopher cats. Yeah, that's great. Then there's barn owls, which are, uh, they, they feed primarily on gophers. And they're pretty easy to attract by putting a barn owl box up. And uh, they can eat a 1,000 gophers a year, a family of barn owls. Wow. And putting up a, a box uh, is a really good thing for barn owls because they, they're cavity nesters. And the cavities that are usually, a, for them, the nest are becoming fewer and fewer. And so uh, a really good place to get a barn owl box is through this uh, nonprofit organization called uh, the Hungry Owl Project in Marin. And uh, they sell barn owl boxes, and, and uh, the money they make from selling the barn owl boxes they use to save the lives of, of uh, owls and other predatory birds that have been um, poisoned by eating poisoned gophers and poisoned rats. So is that something that you could do in an urban setting is put up a, a box for owls? Would that be okay to do if you lived like in downtown Santa Barbara or downtown Santa Cruz? Yes and no. I mean, you might attract a barn owl, but chances are you'd have to be in a slightly more suburban situation to do it. Interestingly enough, barn owls also nest in palm trees and uh, in the... Uh, urban uh, Santa Barbara and Santa Cruz, there are a number of palms, and so uh, barn owls do have the opportunity to nest in those. Mm -hmm. I've actually heard them in the palm trees. And if you look below the palm trees where you hear barn owls, you can, you can see the pellets and the bones of uh, gophers right on the ground underneath the tree. Interesting. So, so owls sound great. Cats, what about um, snakes? Is that something, are snakes a good um, gopher predator? Well, the, one of our common snakes is the gopher snake, and it's an excellent gopher predator. Um, but the snake doesn't really uh, eat a lot of gophers because they have a really slow digestion, and it takes them four weeks to digest one gopher. So they eat just like one a month. <laughs> so that's not your, <laughs> your fastest way of getting rid of gophers. You'd have to get about 100 snakes. <laughs> Well, and the only way to attract a gopher snake is to actually have a lot of gophers. So it's kind of, first you have to have a, go a lot of gophers in order to attract a snake. Cats and owls are really great ways to control um, your gopher populations. Is there Are there any other animals that you could attract to your um, yard? Well, again, uh, having a lot of gophers does attract uh, other animals. Um, up here in Santa Cruz, probably down in Santa Barbara, too, uh, the great blue heron has become a, a, uh, a gopher predator, surprisingly enough. And I see them all the time eating gophers uh, in fields and stuff. And then, um, you know, the way to attract the great blue heron, though, is to have a, uh, a gopher problem, <laughs> and then they'll come. <laughs> <laughs> yep, and I know many, many people here that have gopher problems. Now, Thomas, I had a question for you. My friends had a thriving business Many years ago, they had an organic heirloom nursery, and one of the ways that we made money there, and I worked there, was bagging up huge Ziploc bags of zoo poo, <laughs> which was from large animals at the zoo, and people from all over the states would order the zoo poo to put down near the gopher holes to try and get rid of the gophers. Did that really work, do you think, or was that something that... Um, is there any is there any basis to that um, idea that large animal uh, manure will keep away gophers? Well, I think there is, and in fact, I think that uh, any manure will keep away gophers. Um, cats.
cat litter, bits and use, dog poop, um, anything. Because gophers are really kind of fastidious creatures, and they don't like anything that uh, is foul-smelling or disgusting or in their homes or around their homes. You know, they, they just uh, have this sense of cleanliness. In fact, gophers clean out their tunnels every day. You can, uh, if you get up early enough, and between uh, sunrise and about an hour after sunrise, you can see gophers out there cleaning their homes up, and most of their burrow openings will be open. What about, too, Thomas, the idea, because um, when I, this was probably 10, 12 years ago, I worked at this organic farm, the nursery, and we were all very um, into Finhorn Garden and, you know, connecting with the plants and the animals and the land. And it was like, oh, gophers, no problem. We'll, you know, commune with them and <laughs> and kind of send out the message, don't come, we'll share with you. But they wiped out so many plants. So do you believe there's any basis in that idea that you can actually vibrationally <laughs> help um, with a gopher problem? Well, interestingly enough, I, I do this lecture called Nonviolent Gopher Control where I work with someone from Finhorn. That uh, I do the first part of the lecture and we talk about barriers and disgusting things to put around gopher holes and stuff. And the second half, she um, talks about um, how to meditate and work with gophers um, to keep them away from your plants set up a mental barrier around your garden. In fact, the story she tells often is um, how that she can connect with the gophers so that they come, she calls them gophers, she's German, so that they can come to the surface and then she just picks them up and puts them in a bucket and relocates them. That is amazing. It is amazing. I've never seen it, but I'd like to someday. Well, there, there you go. <laughs> now, Thomas, could you tell us, um, from reading on your website, I was um, interested in also moles and voles. And number one, what is the difference besides one letter in their name? I never realized. It was just a one-letter difference. Well, the biggest difference between gophers, moles, and voles is that gophers and voles eat plants. Um, gophers, of course, focus more on the roots, and voles focus more on the, the uh, bark layers of plants. They like to chew off bark. And uh, so those guys are the plant eaters, and then moles are insectivores. They don't eat plants at all. They're not built to eat plants. They eat worms and grubs and uh, uh, sometimes small insects. And uh, moles can be very beneficial for a garden uh, in that respect, is that they, they eat grubs that turn into caterpillars that can be a problem. And uh, the, the problem between moles and gophers is that most people can't tell the difference between a mole mound and a gopher hill. Or, no, it's gopher mound and mole hill. And so they treat moles like a problem, like they would treat gophers. So identifying the burrow is uh, actually another thing that we're going to be doing uh, in Fairview Garden, is, is really discerning the difference between the two. And then moles... Moles have these little colonies of, uh, with a series of holes and trails between them on the ground. And uh, voles are actually pretty easy to, to control by, um, by using certain products. That, uh, I use this product a lot called uh, Critter Ritter. It has uh, black pepper and the capsaicin from uh, hot pepper in it. And uh, that will move a, a vole colony almost in one day. So they just try, they avoid certain substances, and that, that sounds like an easy way to get rid of them. Yeah, that is a great product. I use it for um, sometimes raccoons and skunks uh, will be digging in, uh, in your garden or digging, especially if you have a sod lawn or a new sod lawn, they'll flip over the sod to eat the grubs underneath, under it, and that product will stop them uh, in one night. Do you think, uh, and I read in a couple articles that voles can be beneficial for the garden and yard. Is that true, and if so, why? Well, I've never read an article about voles being beneficial. W was voles it moles, are, maybe? Moles can yeah. be beneficial. Voles are, are the same thing as meadow mice. Mm. And, you know, like all animals, they're here on Earth for a purpose. And uh, their purpose, I guess, is, you know, um, moving seeds around and 
gathering things, but uh, I've never heard of a vole being beneficial for someone's garden. Mm. I guess a very little fertilization goes on, but uh, for the most part. Whereas moles, uh, I think, are very beneficial. It must, it must have been moles, and I got them confused. That's just one letter, Jill. <laughs> yeah, I know. So tell us now, so we've gone over moles, voles, gophers. What about ground squirrels? Do they um, rank in the maybe top five unwanted um, pests? Out of control, I should say, because I think that um, any animal that, isn't overpopulating an area usually has a part to play in the um, <coughs> ecosystem of the garden. Excuse me. So ground squirrels, would you say that they can also be a pest? I know in Santa Barbara they're eroding um, along the cliffs on the ocean. The ground squirrels are causing a big problem with erosion. Well, ground squirrels are a huge problem in, the, in that they, uh, instead of making little tiny burrows in the ground, they make large burrows. And the burrows are very deep and extensive. And so they, they're a major cause of erosion. And again, uh, in the levees in Pajaro, uh, around Watsonville, they're, they're tremendously destructive and can cause, uh, during floodwaters, can cause a huge problem. Uh, also, they undermine foundations. Uh, I've seen at the University of California where they actually have toppled uh, cement stairways by undermining the foundation and have caused huge damage there. They really like to be around schools for some reason because kids feed them snacks all the time. And um, the problem is they, the squirrels and the kids really aren't a good match because they carry diseases. They, being a communal animal, unlike the solitary animals like gophers and moles, ground squirrels are community animals and they live in colonies. And so they have fleas and they... Uh, carry diseases such as rabies. And in Monterey County last year, there was even a case of uh, bubonic plague carried by a ground squirrel. So they're really a problem. Mm -hmm. and, and what would you use similar methods of control for the gophers for the squirrels, or is it a totally different um, way of uh, dealing with it, with the problem? In an area that's kind of infested with ground squirrels, it's, it is literally like an ocean of squirrels. And if you were to... Um, eliminate some in the middle, the ocean just closes back in again. They're, they're really persistent. So some of the things you can do um, with ground squirrels, for example, in a garden or a tree situation is, um, oh, and they, they will, um, for farmers, they can decimate crops, crops very quickly. Like I've seen them take down a whole cornfield in a matter of 10 days. Just take the corn cobs just when they're almost ripe and um, take them down into their burrows and stuff. So um, you can use some barriers to slow them down because they uh, they have to be able to see where they're going. Trapping is often used. Poisons are used extensively for ground squirrels and, and have been a problem um, with secondary poisoning especially. Um, and especially now, um, ground squirrels are one of the... Uh, animals that are on farmlands, and, you know, since the whole E. coli poisoning happened with the, the spinach and, and this great sensitivity about uh, keeping your fields cleaner, mm -hmm. um, although they've never determined that the E. coli that caused any of the uh, accidental sicknesses were attributed to wildlife, farmers are now being very, very careful about uh, wildlife around their farms. And in fact, a lot of them are trying to make their farms sterile, completely mm -hmm. free of wildlife. And so uh, poison seems to be the, the answer which or the, the concept. Right, and which is not good at all for the health of the soil. It's not good for the health of the soil. It's not, um, it eliminates diversity. And uh, I think it, it causes potential for a much larger failure. And it's kind of a, it's a problem in agriculture because you could understand why uh, the, a, a, an agricultural, or I should say an agricultural distributor would want to ensure their customers that they're not eating anything that possibly could have any pathogens on it. And so the only way they could conceive of doing that is eliminating any possible vector. And so it's, it's a real big problem in agriculture right now especially when um, 
looking at organic systems or sustainable systems, there has to be a, an element of diversity there. But what the, the whole ground squirrel thing is, or not just ground squirrels, but just rodents and animals in, in farms is doing is, is going the opposite direction. But that's kind of a digression. <laughs> what you're asking is what to do about ground squirrels. And so what a lot of um, farmers and, and landowners are doing is, um, aside from the poisons, you can get these, um, these uh, smoke bombs from the agricultural commissioner, which you can um, put into the burrows to stop them. Um, you can do trapping, and there's a, a live trap that's uh, very, very effective. It's a, a trap that, that uh, captures a whole colony at one time. I think I saw a picture on your website. Is that the one? There's like maybe 20 squirrels in a cage. Right. Yeah. And what do you do with them once you have them? Well, that's the really hard part about it. I mean, you really can't release um, ground squirrels somewhere else. I mean, nobody really wants them around. Um, in wild areas where there are ground squirrels, usually the population is already at its max. And so you, you end up having to... Um, euthanize the animals, or I know some people that take the animals to uh, um, places where there are predatory birds, like, for example, the place where the predatory owls are being rehabilitated. That's a possibility. Mm -hmm. But uh, often um, they're euthanized. And would, which is probably a more humane way to go than the poisons, obviously. I'd say yes, because you're not getting any secondary um, kill any secondary poisoning, mm -hmm. and also because um, you know, poisoning isn't necessarily humane, especially like anticoagulants where the animal is um, is sick for a number of days. Yeah, that, that just seems like a terrible thing to do. I've seen that happen to um, mice and rats, and it's just sad. One method I've seen that was seemed very extreme, and I don't know, um, I think it was used for gophers, is some big blowtorch thing. I saw it in a class I was in where this guy had this, it was like a giant flamethrower thing, and he put it in, I think, gopher holes. Does that work? And if so, how? And is that a humane way to kill gophers? Well, that's a tool called the, uh, what's called the Rodinator for quite a while, and uh, now it's called the Rodex 4000. And it actually um, injects oxygen and propane into the, the holes of gophers, and, and then uh, a little spark plug at the end ignites it, and the whole mixture explodes. Um, uh, humane, I'm not sure what to say about that. It does, it does, do, do, uh, it does kill animals instantly. Um, the only time that I think that that, uh, that tool is good for gophers, though, is like in a vineyard or an orchard. I mean, you wouldn't want to use it in your lawn or your garden. It's just too big of a tool for that. But uh, along um, the crop rows in an orchard or a vineyard, there's usually a large common gopher mound, or not mound, but tunnel. It's probably about as big as your fist, and um, gophers just, just use it and eat the roots of the plants, and you can't even tell us that they're there because that big, big uh, tunnel's there. And what this tool does is actually um, collapse the tunnel so you can start to see um, surface activity again with gophers and you can control it. Works really well for that. It also works for, uh, again, ground squirrels because um, you can uh, work within the burrow with it. Thomas, we have about um, five minutes left, and I wanted to ask one quick question about deer as a problem. I have a lot of friends who live in the hills, um, foothills of Santa Barbara, and they say the deer can just wipe out avocados and all sorts of trees. And Do you know of any methods um, of control for deer that, that actually work? Well, the best, the best method I know of is a fence. If you can put a fence up, then it's, it's well worth it. And there's lots of uh, fencing options these days. Um, the, the best fence I know of, and uh, I've put up two miles of this at our farm, is um, it's called field fence, high tensile field fence. It's seven feet tall. The thing about it being high tensile is you can stretch it on posts that are pretty far apart, like as far apart as 30 feet. So the fence isn't that visible, but it's, it's highly effective. And there's also a, uh, a more inexpensive fence that's 
It's a, uh, a woven nylon mesh. It's really easy to put up because you can just uh, put it on these uh, T-posts very easily. And, it, and you, it's practically invisible as well. But uh, fences are the best thing I know of. If you can't do a fence, then um, some people put rings of wire um, netting around trees and plants. Then there's a bunch of products you can try that uh, deter deer. Uh, most of them are made from, again, pepper or, uh, or rotten eggs are another one. Um, fish emulsion is another one. All these things that deer don't like, they have to be constantly reapplied. And they all have very uh, kind of clever names. Like there's one called Not Tonight Deer. <laughs> have you heard of that one? No, but that's great. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. So there's, it sounds like there's a lot of options out there. It's just finding the ones that work. And you've been, you were an organic farmer for many years, and um, now you've mo moved into this um, Gophers Limited, your, your company. What would you say are the top maybe three things that a homeowner or just someone that has a garden can do to maintain a balance with the pests in their yards? And what, would, what advice could you give them? We've kind of just kind of sum up maybe what we've talked about. If you're talking about a landscape and not a garden around your house, probably the thing that uh, you could do the most is to use plants that gophers eat the least. For example, um, woody perennials, they're aromatic, like uh, lavender or sages. Um, they're water-conserving plants. They are beautiful, and uh, gophers don't really mess with them too much. Um, other things you could do is use barriers, like... Uh, like we were talking about earlier, gopher wire baskets or gopher wire um, underlayments of uh, beds and lawns. And by the way, there's a new product out now. Uh, it's a stainless steel gopher basket that uh, lasts forever, which is a really good way to do it. Let's see. The third thing is is to be uh, be proactive and learn how to how to trap gophers or or um, Hire someone to do it. There's a, there are lots of people around. And uh, if you want to do it yourself, come into my class uh, on uh, August 8th. It's going to be um, kind of your uh, way to learn it, and I'll have equipment there as well. That sounds great. Or you can also learn to be a really good meditator and then co um, connect with the gophers and actually lift them like, <laughs> like your friend, which sounds amazing. Well, I really <laughs> encourage people to do that. I mean, mm -hmm. that's definitely the, the most earthly way to do it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, do you believe, Thomas, that most people, and you've been doing this work for 10 years now, um, specifically with Gophers Limited, do you believe that most people do want to use more humane methods of control? Well, well I find that um, that's kind of the, uh, the reason my business is growing, especially in Santa Cruz, where people are beginning to realize that, that uh, using poisons is not the answer or using traps that aren't humane are not the answer. People really care about the environment. It's kind of a, I think that, that there is a, uh, an emerging in environmental consciousness throughout our, our culture now that, that may have gotten lost uh, in the post-World War II Green Revolution. And I think we're coming back to looking at uh, all the different factors that make um, an environment strong. That's one thing about your website and your work that I really liked was it seems like you really respect the animals that you're actually helping people to control in their yards. And that was nice. That's a nice switch from a lot of, um, quote, pest control um, companies. Well, interestingly enough, the uh, thing about poisons are that they're kind of cold killers. And it's this mentality that we have now is that, oh, we can, we can eliminate our problems without really knowing what happens. And that's what happens when you use poisons. You you put the poison in, and the problem goes away, and you don't you don't know what happened. You know, it's very cold. You don't have a personal connection with what's going on, and so that that uh, kind of cold method is is the mentality that we've really kind of gotten into from the 50s and 60s, and you know, the whole big poison era. And I think now people are taking a second look at. Uh, at what's going on. Mm -hmm. 
And, and you're definitely helping them do that. And again, um, if you would like more information on Thomas Whitman's Gophers Limited company, it's www.gopherslimited.com. Thank you so much, Thomas. It's been a pleasure to talk with you today. Well, thank you, Jill. It's been a pleasure on my part as well. You've been listening to a Sustainable World Radio podcast. For more information or to hear our other podcasts or interviews, visit www.sustainableworldradio.com. Sustainable World Radio is produced by Jill Cloutier. Music by Dana Lyons. Thanks for listening.